You're listening to the free feed of occult symbolism and pop culture, which means you're missing out. Help the show out. Get rewarded with bonuses. Join any of my three supporter feeds. You'll get the ad-free experience, early access, and unlock hundreds of bonus episodes the free feed losers don't get to hear. You can also score free books, discounted merch, and more. The most popular option is patreon.com slash Illuminati Watcher. The easiest one is Apple Premium, where you sign up on the app. The cheapest one is my own, IlluminatiWatcher.com VIP section. Compare the three platforms at IlluminatiWatcher.com. Hit the VIP tab up top. Links are always in the show notes. Ooh, yeah! There's this, the, the Christian eschatology, the Christian worldview of like the way things are supposed to, to go. And then the opposition to that, the opposition being witchcraft and neo-paganism, uh, as well as Satanism and over-reliance on science and stuff like this. This wow. is all sort of like, this is what I think to answer your question earlier about like, why are the Christians pushing back to that? I think it's because all of those things are on one side of the coin that's opposing the Christian eschatology. Wow. Welcome back to A Call Symbolism and Pop Culture. I'm your host, Isaac Wiseup. Today, we're joined by a very special guest, a friend of mine, Jordan, who runs Wind and Sea Coffee. And he's about to blow your mind. We're going to talk about John D. And this is a long overdue topic. John D. is the guy who arguably started it all. An architect of the modern day reality of the occult coming to Revelation. Yeah. If you don't know who John D. is, you got to listen to this episode. If you do know who John D. is, you got to listen to this episode. Because we're going to be going into all kinds of realms and territories that are going to connect a lot of the dots we've been talking about over the years we're gonna uh, and this is long overdue uh we're gonna of course introduce jordan to you in case you don't know who he is and uh, that'll be like maybe the first 15 20 minutes we're gonna talk about his journey uh you know going through the military service and navy seal navy seals uh buds training and stuff like that and then we're gonna get into john d we're gonna talk about scrying the aethers and some of the visions this guy had that, you know, could tie into Twin Peaks, maybe. I don't know. We'll see. And <laughs> we'll talk about the Invisible College because this is all related to the modern day UFO, UAP disclosure phenomenon. It's all connected. I swear to you it is. Uh, Rosicrucianism. Uh, we're going to talk about Aleister Crowley and some differences in the generations that sort of prove what he was talking about with this Aeon of Horus talk. And we'll get into talk about the abyss and Twin Peaks, White Lodge, Black Lodge kind of stuff. And some interesting ideas Jordan points out about the Abbey of Thelema in Italy and how that actually could have opened up the portals for the first uh, UFO that Mussolini captured with Enrico Fermi. Sounds wild. It is. I asked, I asked Jordan to get on this show and, and bring the heat with John D. And he absolutely did not disappoint. We went way over on time uh this is going to be one of those deep dive long episodes that some of you guys have been asking for so uh man uh, i'm i'm just going to pass it right on we're going to get right into it um <laughs> hide your wife hide your kids here comes jordan we're gonna talk about john d let's go all right everybody we're back he's he's actually a returning champ he was on my uh inside the mind of a conspiracy theorist show years ago He's the easily the best looking CEO of the coffee company in in America for sure. I'm a I'm a subscriber as well to his coffee. It's the best coffee there is. Uh, we've got Jordan from Wind and Sea Coffee. Jordan, welcome to Occult Symbolism of Pop Culture. What's up, Isaac? I'm so happy to be back. Yeah, cheers, uh, man. I'm happy to have you back on. And and today we're gonna talk about John D, which is a a massive subject as it turns out in fact in fact jordan sent me this amazing book by jason louv he uh jason louv does a lot of occult discussions of uh magic and manifestation and things like that so I, I'm, I'm very familiar with him i didn't know i actually didn't know he wrote this book until you mailed this to me it's called J john d and the empire of angels and this is a dense ass book folks um what is this five it's like 500 pages and it's high octane i'm I'm still working my way through it. I, I was, I had a good, uh, I had good inertia going into it and then I got distracted. So I'm like maybe halfway through it. Um, and, and I have notes in my margins, but I know you have been really into this book. Uh, you've read it a couple of times from what I remember talking to you and, and I want to talk to you about it today, but first I want to, I want to introduce you to the audience because 
Um, there's probably some folks and who I'm, I'm going to guess some of the regular listeners have heard me cite your coffee because I, I say it because I actually I love your coffee. And in fact, I, I just um, I bought some I bought some extra bags. Like, you know, I do the monthly subscription, but I bought some extra bags for some uh, Christmas gifts. Uh, for some friends, I'm trying to I try to spread the word because I'm like, man, this, this coffee's great. Jordan's a great dude, Legend. and uh, you know, I don't know, we we got a good vibe, and uh, you know, I just I want to support my my uh, my American company with made in America products, military veterans, all that, all the stuff you, all the vibes you put out, man, like that's my jam. So uh, yeah, let, let's talk let's talk about what got you down this path because. A lot of people probably aren't familiar with who you are, and uh, I've seen you. Uh, you've been hitting some podcasts lately and such. Um, but 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 take us take us on your journey, uh, real quick. Let's introduce yeah. you to um, the audience. Yeah, for sure. So thanks, Isaac. I uh, you know I just want to say I'm such a fan of your show. I think you're a very refreshing voice in the you know kind of truther world and in thanks, the alternative media in general. It's really unfortunate just all of the suppression that people like you are facing when you know i don't feel like what you're doing is is harmful in any way but side note anyway right, so right. thank you man appreciate that yeah dude yeah i just I'm a, I'm a true fan and i really appreciate i feel like it's it there's a lot of like uh real passion behind what i have for your you know work as well so I, I, the, the feeling is mutual yeah cheers. um but a little bit of background so yeah my name's jordan um and I was in the military. Um, I worked in special operations. I had a kind of training injury that sidelined my career in the military and um, got me kind of exploring this path of natural wellness. Um, I had been on, you know, while I was recovering a lot of injections, surgeries, um, pills, pharmaceuticals, um, very Western approach to medicine. And <clears throat> I just felt like they're could be something better out there. I started exploring some plant medicines and, and like more holistic um, stuff and found relief from doing that, but still felt like it was this thing that just sat in my medicine cabinet. I had to remember to take it. You know, I'm like, there's got to be a more convenient way that I look forward to actually like taking the stuff that doesn't taste terrible, you know, and um, is like an aspirational part of my day. So what's a habit that I'm already doing that I've already carved out the time for? And how do I make that little ritual more beneficial? So we started infusing our coffee <clears throat> with adaptogens and adaptogens are essentially mother's nature's medicine. It's it's roots, herbs, uh, mushrooms, and plants that help your body regulate and manage stress, restore balance, as well as boost mental and physical performance. So a lot of these functional mushrooms, you know, they help with cognition, lowering blood pressure, um, you know, decreasing that cortisol spike that you get from the caffeine. Um, and so just kind of improving the way that caffeine works on your body and giving you holistic health without, you know, having to take pharmaceuticals for all of these other things or to, or to minimize, you know, your reliance on those, those methods. So yeah, that's kind of the, uh, the essentially the product, but what we're really about is, is adapted like holistic wellness for coffee lovers. And a big part of our mission is donating um, some of our revenue to veteran nonprofits, um, specifically in the realm of surf therapy, which is, you know, another form of holistic wellness for veterans, getting people in touch with nature, doing physical activity, putting them in community and, um, you know, just experiencing rehab through recreation. So mm -hmm. that's a little bit about me. Yeah, I think that habit stacking, um, that, that's a term I learned. One of my CrossFit coaches, I learned a lot about nutrition from. She was telling me, uh, it, it sounds similar to that idea of habit stacking. You find something that you just, you you ritualistically do that you don't even think about or you even enjoy and then sort of attach something to that habit. And, uh, you know, it, it sort of incorporates it into your rituals. And uh, that's actually a pretty great idea. Uh, yeah. I, I was doing a... a adaptogens um mushroom supplements for mm -hmm. a long time in fact i still take some but um, i was really deep into the mushroom 
<laughs> the mushroom yeah, yeah. rabbit all for a while there. How did it go for you? Did you it was good? I, yeah. you know, the, they opened up my eyes in many ways. Um, but the, uh, I, I take this, uh, Stamets seven mm. as like a mixture of, you know, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not like a mushroom nerd, but I, I saw enough over like the months I was researching. Yeah, he definitely is. He's got the, <laughs> he's got the mushroom hat. <laughs> yeah. 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 I love it. Yeah. He, uh, yeah, that it's, it, it, there's something to it. Right. Um, mm. I even grew some mushrooms for a while there, like the the not the uh, psychedelic kind, but yeah, like, yeah, uh, like the edible kind. Um, okay, so yeah, and and you're being humble there, right? You you had uh, last time I talked to you, I remember you were telling me you were you uh, went through through some buds training, Navy SEAL training. Mm -hmm. How was that? It, it was uh, it was super hard, but also like very very rewarding. It was. Um, you know, so yeah, a little bit of a background. I, I went through BUDS training, but washed out uh, at some point, ended up going to a ship, deploying, was kind of like a deck hand, lowest of the low, making my way back out from deck into uh, the medical field, and then specifically in the like Force Recon and MARSOC community, which is like the Marines version of mm -hmm. the SEALs. Um, so I feel like I, I spent like basically my entire career just getting like my, uh, um, ass handed to me. <laughs> you know? well, why do they, why do they, is that typical where you go from, I mean, people who get into, but like, there's a, there's a, what do you call it, Like in doc where just to test jobs to see if you can even get into buds. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So, so why do they, why do they take people who are very strong mentally and physically and even if they wash out of buds for whatever reason, which is a very high washout rate, from what I understand, why do they why do they put you back on the sort of you know average Joe job? Why don't they push you right into another sort of form of spec ops? Because they hate you. Uh, <laughs> they, they're <laughs> really <laughs> testing you. Yeah. They, it's like I don't know. It's it's kind of it's it, it's true. It's it's it seems like just poor management, honestly. But oh. I do feel like on some level, it's a form of like punishment it's kind of because and then it sucks even more when you get to the to like your next command like if when you know on a ship because you have all of these people that you know in deck crew and they kind of already assume that you think that you're better than everybody and like oh. that you have a chip on your shoulder so they like make sure like extra to like you know knock you down a peg and and make, make you feel like you're not special and that you you know you're you're low so you don't even have a a, a, a rate which is like a mos like a job specialty and sp so because since you don't have a rate you can't rank up so you just i mean i'm there i had my four-year college degree you know and i cannot even rank up above uh you know e3 that was like what i came in as oh wow <laughs> yeah you didn't go in as an officer with a degree yeah, I did not because oh. uh, specifically for special operations, it's just easier to there, there are more billets for enlisted guys um, within like the SEAL community and others. Um, so it makes a lot. Of, I think like 70 percent of guys have college degrees, even if they're uh, enlisted within the spec war community. Oh, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, I was I I was trying to re-enlist in the EOD, which isn't mm. quite spec ops, but for the Air Force. Mm. And I had my degree and I was trying to get in as the officer. And I remember the current officer in charge was kind of I could tell he was kind of pushing back against it. And he oh. and he was right, because he was because I at this point at this point I hadn't really worked out that hard. Um I had gotten pretty soft going through college and everything. And, and he's like, he basically kind of kept challenging me. Like, are you sure you're going to be able to do this? And I'm like, hey, hell yeah, do it, bro. Like whatever. I passed the, uh, I forget what they call it. The, uh, the exams for EOD officer entrance school and everything. And, um, cause mentally I was really sharp <laughs> physically. I was not. And, <laughs> and he was like, all right, dude, well, you're going to come work out with us. And that was the first time I learned about CrossFit because we uh -huh. were doing CrossFit workouts. Yeah. And, and these, yeah men and women there's a woman in there too were whooping my ass and i thought oh maybe i don't have what it takes and he kept telling me he was like he was trying to explain it to me he's like look you're, the, you're if you're going to be the officer in charge 
Mm. You, you can't just barely yep. keep up with these guys. You got to be at the front. Like you got to be faster. And I got a guy who runs a mile and a half in like eight minutes. And I was doing it in about 14 minutes at that time. <laughs> I said, Oh shit. Okay. So I kind of, I stretched my timeline out, got in better shape, still nowhere close to what I needed to be, to be honest. Yeah. And, yeah. and then I, I ended up getting um, rejected for uh, medical reasons. Um, ironically i had seen a therapist my dad died and i saw a th i was seeing a therapist which i still see and uh it was for depression and anxiety but i i i wasn't on any prescriptions because i told him i was like i don't want that shit like keep it away from me mm -hmm. and um and that was why they wouldn't let me re-enlist that's so interesting and i was like i don't know anyway um okay yeah, that, that is interesting that uh that the, the that would they would have more enlisted folks. I, I never even thought of that. That would I mean, make sense though. Because the officers are managers, like even even within like the SEAL community or Marine Marsaw community, like you do, you know, you'll do one or two pumps as like a guy on the ground, and then as soon as you're done with that, dude, you're like in doing admin work, you know. You could mm. be like all these like seal admirals and stuff like that like they're they're administrators seal lieutenants administrators um you know it's it's the enlisted guys that end up like spending 20 years you know as a breacher or something mm -hmm. doing like the high speed kind of jobs so yeah. a lot of guys don't want to do admin stuff you know that's kind of why they they so they just avoid the that route oh, okay. together, you know that makes sense that makes mm -hmm. sense okay all right. Well, well, interesting. And then you got you 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 get out of the the navy altogether. Yep. Yeah, and... I got medically separated for did my uh injury. Oh, and okay. Then, yeah. And, and that's what led you down this path yep. of creating the adaptogen infused coffees with wind and sea. Yep. Um and are are you from that area? San Diego, right? Like I are live you from in San there? Diego? I'm from New Mexico actually. Okay. Yeah. Oh, New Mexico. That always comes yeah. up in uh, the occult. It's stuff. a weird spot, dude. It's uh, is it? yeah, yeah, it really is. <laughs> I've never actually, I've, I, I don't think I've ever, I've driven through New Mexico on, I think mm -hmm. it was like I-10 on the south end of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I don't think I've ever stepped foot in New Mexico and I, I keep intending to go down to the, uh, the Roswell nerdy mm -hmm. ass alien thing they do every year. Yeah. Uh, have you ever been to that? So I've driven through Roswell and like they have, you know, like kitschy little alien stuff all over, but I've not, I haven't really like seen the museum or anything. Um, but there's other weird spots too. I mean, there's like uh, Dulce, New Mexico is very odd. They say that's kind of like the Skinwalker Ranch of New, Mex New Mexico, I guess. Um, uh, there's White Sands, which is like where the Manhattan Project took place. Mm -hmm. And that place is super cool and like trippy. Um, the big SETI, uh, uh, or it's called like the VLA, the very large array of um, telescope things. You know, all the big satellites that like move in like the like contact. You know, if you ever seen that oh, movie, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. that's that's down there. You can just go up and check them out. So yeah, I, I, I I'm trying cool. to I'm trying to ease my wife. Josie, I'm trying to ease her into this idea of going down there because yeah. there's all these uh strange like locations, right? Like like yeah. Dulce, I think that's where they say there's a lot of underground military bases. And mm -hmm. that one dude, I can't think of his name, said that he saw aliens and stuff down there and yeah. whatever, right? Right, but, right. Um, but then you've got like uh Socorro, New Mexico was where one crash happened. There's uh, this mysterious classified sacred place that Diana Pasalka talked about. Yeah. To be determined where that is. Um, and then, of course, uh, twice a year, I think it's twice a year down at the Trinity site in, I, I guess it's in White Sands. Yeah. Yeah. Is where you can go twice a year, go down to where they actually detonated the first atomic bomb testing. And the, uh, they've got a, mono, a black monolith um, erected there and stuff. Interesting. Thing. yeah it, new mexico is a strange place dude yeah it, it definitely is and then santa fe the santa fe institute does a bunch of like kind of i don't really know what they do but it's kind of like a darpa e organization for you know like leading edge science uh and oh, then heard that. you know zorro ranch that was in santa fe also that was like epstein's spot so there's a lot of like kind of ooky spooky yeah spooky for sure yeah out there and it's beautiful it really is like natural beauty is you know it's it's a great place to go hiking and you know rivers and stuff like that yeah 
Yeah, yeah definitely. Well, that, well, that's a good segue into uh, yeah. John D because totally. the New Mexico is is loaded down with paranormal stuff uh, when you start digging into that. But John D is kind of the I don't know, but maybe he is. Maybe he's the godfather of making contact with entities in a way. Totally. Um, totally. And, and I I know I know you've read this book through and through and you know when i first when you sent it to me i, I first started reading i thought oh this would be great i'll do a whole show about john d and i went through and i started taking notes and it's just so much i mean this would be if you went through this whole book i mean it would take you i mean it would have to be at least 10 to 20 hours of at, at the and you wouldn't even scratch the surface of what dude gets into i, I don't know how he researched all this to be honest it's, no it's crazy uh, so i w- I feel like um, the middle section, uh, I mean, it's very granular biographical account of John D's life and sort of, you know, his life. But I think where it starts coming back around to stuff that you talk about on like your shows is kind of in the last like third of the book. Um, you know, kind of you get out of some of like the more granular details of just like, you know, while he was alive and then more into like, how did his legacy affect everything kind of oh, going? Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, because I'm kind of stuck in that middle part yeah, where you're like, oh my god, I mean, names, dates, names, dates. Like yeah, yeah. It's 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 yeah. it's like way down in the weeds of yeah, middle fair. age politics. And I'm like, bro, yeah, yeah, exactly, that. exactly. <laughs> you know, once you get past that a little bit, but yeah, if you want, so what I can do is just kind of run through a quick little like outline of yeah. the, of the book and then we can you know riff off of that and just yeah yeah let's do that man. if you have anything interesting that you want to talk about or yeah let's, let, or yeah let's run through it man because I, i'd like to compare notes and, and maybe give me some motivation to get through this because I'm, <laughs> I'm you know well, i read i'm i'm not even exaggerating i bet i'm reading 10 different books right now yeah, and dude i feel you like, I, I, I don't know why i can't just focus and get through one entire book i guess because all these topics come up you know like this netflix movie now is dominating the conversation i just i i'm constantly getting dragged from one topic to the other and and i think oh well, i should read this book keep reading this book uh you know this kenneth grant book outside the circles of time is the one that talks about the the trinity test opening up a portal and that's oh, i'm trying to read through right, it dude. to that's catch cool. Yeah, because I'm doing the you know the Twin Peaks thing. Oh, you watch Twin Peaks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I so I haven't really watched the show. I have actually watched like most of season one, but I've been following your okay. series. You know, it's kind of like you know getting me motivated to keep sticking with it and stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. But it's funny that you mentioned that Kenneth Grant book because that's actually referenced in this book um, towards the end of the thing uh, where they start talking about like Jack Parsons um, section. Oh, dope. Yeah, yeah, man. So yeah, let's, yeah, take well, it, let's take it from the top, dude. Right, cool. the so so kind of work through it. Book's called John D and the Empire Angels. So what is Enochian magic? It's a system of magic discovered by John D and Edward Kelly over the co- course of many decades through a series of communications with conjured angels. The system allows users to communicate with angels and or non uh, other non-human intelligences, and it's a very potent high octane system that's been known to like drive people mad and just ruin their lives. Do you, know if that's the, do you know if that's the, the, the phrase they use in this book, non-human intelligence? So yeah, they, they do actually use that in there because um, it, it's one of Jason Lube's, uh like terms for it because it's like, you know, they, pres- the lens through which John D and Edward Kelly, you know, could view these entities was, as though they were angels, John D was like a Protestant, um, very like devout religious guy. So that was sort of like the the way. But you know, other like Crowley didn't necessarily view them as angels. He kind of viewed them in you know through his contextual lens. And it, people like Pasolka or you know Tyler D or any of these other people, if these they might view them as you know interdimensional this or who knows so um well, it's kind of a more accurate catch because i was talking with my buddy about this yeah. the other day and this exact thing uh you know because they're rebranding stuff now and they're not just and that tells me they're about to 
tell us some kind of truth about all this. So how they're like, well, we're not calling them UFOs anymore. We're calling them UAP, and they're not aliens. They're they're non-human intelligence. And you see that phrase yeah, NHI, all over the place. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And uh-huh. and my buddy was saying that because in Diana Pasalka's new book, they uh, she has a conversation with a person about this theory that AI is actually the you you know this entity this alien this non-human intelligence yeah and and my buddy he he kind of was saying that he thinks that's the real reason why they're trying to shift the perspective and change the terms from nhi is because they think that ai is going to be the that like that really is like we tapped into some kind of consciousness of ourselves from the future or something like that right right yeah interesting it's in this book too totally It, it absolutely um, Do you think that's you think that's what's going on here is because that that's kind of the theory that I've been subscribed to and and digging into for the last so many years is that it's what we're dealing with is occult practices and occult beliefs that have been underground for the last several hundred years and and this goes back to John D of course because John D's the guy who kind of started this and now they're willing to sort of come back and say okay well the the occult view of reality isn't so far from the truth and now we've got to deal with that dude the the occult view of reality has more in common like there's actually a lot of overlap with the scientific method um you know humanism like a lot of these sort of things that we take for granted as secular philosophy and just like secular fields um a lot of it can be traced back to John D. I think that's why John D is such a an interesting figure because um, you know so much of modern day just culture, everything from you know NASA, AI, Katy Perry's halftime show, the Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band cover, all of the all of these things, uh, you know Shakespeare. Uh, Martin Luther, the Rosicrucians, all of these things can trace their lineage back to John D and these, you know, channeling of of angels and his sort of Enochian system. So it does inform a lot of the things that we we talk about today. This is where I get kind of mind melted because the and, and you know me, right? I'm I'm the most lukewarm orthodox christian there there is i don't go to church much and uh i have a lot of doubts in my own faith and you'll burn in hell for it but (laughs) (laughs) apparently from what i hear and but then i think about the you know because in from the christian perspective it's very much oh my god like these occultists are talking to aliens they're actually demons and all this is the bad stuff and then also lump in some of their the christian beliefs that you know and sex sex is so bad it's the worst thing ever you shouldn't do it and all these things you should only do it to procreate and and that's where i i struggle because when i the more i research and learn about the occult the more i think is this is the problem did they know all these years these hundreds of years that yes you could contact entities from some other dimension and yes sex can be worked as a magical tool um the most powerful tool there is in creating a new reality and that's a threat to the the church structure and system of having a sort of priest as an intermediary between god and man Hmm. um so that's why they shut it down and that's why we've got just hundreds of years of social construct that says you shouldn't and, and and in fact you'll burn in hell if you do any of these things um like that's that's where my my like that's the thing that that i can't sort of get past well one thing that's kind of interesting i don't know that i exactly know the answer to that question but one thing that is interesting that you learn about with john d and relates to fundamentalist christians now is john d and this sort of contact was a the, the purpose was to help trigger the eschaton that was sort of the messages that he was was getting and that's why he was doing what the angels were kind of telling him to do um 
it was, and he was doing it from the perspective of like, this is what a good Christian would do. Why wouldn't you try, you know, helping Christ come back and, and bringing us into the, the new age of, of, um, you know, the second coming of Christ. So, right, right. you know, and, and so it was like, it was kind of this occult system that he was engaged with and all of the things that sort of happened after was really him making a good faith effort to be a good Christian. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That, that, that makes sense because I remember reading it and I was a little confused that he, you know, he was, you know, back then we had the, uh, I think it was like the church of England, right. Or something. And, and the church was very closely tied in with the monarchy, the Royals, the Royal family and all that. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I thought part of me thought, well, he was doing this stuff and maybe he was just telling people he was a Christian because back in those days it was a heresy and sure. And and a lot of folks did that. There's, there's a line that happens. So um, the queen that was queen uh, during John D's, you know, sort of reign was Queen Elizabeth. And uh, she was, during this time frame. it was very like open, you know, sorcery, um, alchemy. Uh, it was just sort of like a coming out of medieval Europe. And then, yes, there was like the Protestant church had kind of taken over, but there was still a lot of like remnants. It wasn't until Queen Elizabeth's successor, who was King James, that's when all that stuff got outlawed and he had a very like Puritan of, I mean, King James Bible. Like, so it was there, John D sort of um, existed on that line of but like this world that sort of uh, even good Christians could acknowledge that there was like, you know, creepy stuff out there or supernatural stuff out there. And then uh, once you hit King James, it's like, Nope, there's no seances. There's, None of that stuff. So, um, and and then that's where it had to go underground into the invisible college and some of these other concepts that okay. you know. Yeah, because John D was before Isaac Newton and a lot of these. Yeah. Um, because when I went to when I went to college for engineering, I took a ton of science classes and physics and such. And there's there is this this heavy overlap of the forefathers of science almost entirely all of them were practicing occult concepts or Rosicrucianism and, and things like this. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, science, I, I don't think you can separate. In fact, I have a friend who, um, who was also, he went to my church. Uh, so he was also Greek Orthodox and he had a doctorate in, uh, he was a rocket scientist, uh, aeronautics, aer- aeronautics engineering. Yeah. And, and I remember having, I didn't understand it when I, and this is when I was probably 23 or 24 before I even made a blog and all that stuff. This is pre red pill Isaac days. <laughs> and I remember being confused because he was saying about how he kind of didn't like talking about how he was a rocket scientist, like a church. And I thought, why? I was like, why? That's awesome, dude. Like, you're so yeah. smart, man. Like, why, why don't you want to talk about it? And he's just like, well, there's just this sort of, you know, anti-Christian vibe of science. And I didn't really get it. And I think it goes all the way back to uh, probably, you know, the King James <clears throat> stuff where they were they were really pushing against all those occult practices that were very yeah. commonplace to the early scientists. Hey, everybody, the little code stay woke, all one word, all caps, stay woke, all one word, all caps, get 20 percent off Jordan's amazing adaptogen infused coffee. Take advantage of that offer. I am a subscriber myself. You know, this isn't a sponsored ad or nothing like that. He's got great coffee. Check it out. All right, link is in the show notes. Use code STAYWOKE. Listen up. We've seen so many people making ridiculous money from crypto, but did you know it's easy for you to do the same? If you followed my show, you know that we've talked about the cryptocurrencies going all the way back to 2017. Very fascinating subject. But there's a way you can get into all this with the easiest way possible. It's the Copy My Crypto membership site that shows you the coins that YouTuber James McMahon personally holds and allows you to copy him. It's like having a big brother who knows what he's doing. You don't need to know a thing about crypto or how to invest as you simply do what he does. I'm also a member of this, and I've combed through some of the videos. He's got some how-to videos showing you where to get the coins, how to make it happen. 
it's all there for you. So let me tell you about James. He runs the Crypto with James YouTube channel, which despite heavy censorship, we all know YouTube loves the censorship. It's hit 26,000 subscribers, which is a big to do, right? Since March 2020, he told his viewers to buy 26 crypto coins and had you put 100 bucks into each one, it went on to become worth more than $123,000. So of the 26 coins, his top pick of the year, a coin called Phantom, went up 692x from when he said. That one call has retired a number of people, including guys in their 20s and 30s. But remember, this is all public knowledge. You can go to YouTube and verify this for yourself. So if you'd like to join the 2,800 members and your boy Isaac, who copied James, then stop what you're doing. Head over to copymycrypto.com slash Isaac. That's copymycrypto.com forward slash Isaac, I-S-A-A-C, right? Two A's for double awesome. A lot of people misspell that. They throw two S's in there. No, it's two A's for double awesome. You got it. So copymycrypto.com forward slash Isaac. You'll not only find proof of everything I've said, but my listeners get full access for just one dollar. Once again, it's copymycrypto.com forward slash Isaac. Link in the show notes as always. Right, right. Absolutely. I mean, um, he like his job to Queen Elizabeth was counseling on matters of like foreign policy and esoteric symbolism. So it's kind of like the Isaac Weishaupt of, uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> right. uh, and, yeah. Yeah. And, um, so 007, that's kind of another little, uh, interesting bit about John D. So when he would go on these foreign trips, he, when he would write back to the queen, he would sign his correspondences as 007. And, um, that's, it was like this perfect position where he would go as like a, an official emissary, but he could report back on like spying on, you know, whatever he was seeing over there. So he would, and one of his jobs was an occult advisor. So he would go over there this in uh, official capacity as like in either navigation or esoteric science or something like that. And then he would spy and write this stuff back. So Ian Fleming, who was like big in mysticism and sort of occultism himself, as well as espionage, that's why he adopted 007 for James Bond, because it's like it's that overlap of those two worlds, you know. Yeah, that and and that's um you know I was I I made contact with Richard Spence. He's a professor up at the University of Idaho, I think it's the mm-hmm. college, and he yeah. wrote a whole book about the 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 connection between occultism and intelligence agencies. Yeah, right. And and, and I'm I'm just I don't know how to my brain can't wrap around how to verbalize. It just seems like all the research I've done over the years, they all seem to point to this thread of of the sciences with the occult with contact with entities and intelligence agencies like they're just sure so enmeshed with each other over all these years and it goes you know it goes clear back to john d yeah um, i mean i think one of the reasons they're kind of enmeshed is because you know they're both kind of trying to see the way the world really is you know it's like there's whatever is presented and then there's you know what's behind that and um, so, I mean, the occult is literally the hidden stuff. And to sp- when you're spying on something or you're doing espionage, you're sort of obfuscating your your true aims. It's also a lot of the same skills. You got to be you know, very observant and academic in your approach uh, to it. What you're you're kind of blurring the lines of like what is acceptable socially legally a lot of this stuff so i think there and then also it's like who who are the some of the original like just the cia for example who are the original like oss members alan dulles like these these guys were all um like high society uh business people and, and attorneys hmm. Um, and they would do they would do like corporate espionage. That was sort of like the first form of espionage was just like me trying to get inside information about your company so that mm-hmm. I could, you know, and then who are all these people that are, you know, engaged in big business? It's people that went to Yale and Harvard. And now you're looking at these secret societies. So there's always been sort of like this lineage from secret societies, hidden knowledge, the elite that 
translates over to the original, like at least American espionage class of people. And so there's, I, I think there, there's just a lot of like areas where they sort of overlap and that's what makes it kind of like a, a nice, easy fit. <laughs> yeah. It feels like there's two Americas almost because there's these people who are experiencing, you know, like they've already got their wealth locked in and they're pursuing these higher orders of being or trying to steer humanity into some whole other realm. And then you got over here, you've got the, you know, the other 99% of people just trying to sort of make it through their day and trying to make sure. memories with their family. And it's, it's, it's just so bizarre. I, that... I think it's, it's Maslow's hierarchy in some way. It's yeah. like when you, I don't know if you're familiar with that concept, but it's, you know, as if you don't have food and water, like you don't, you're not worried about, um, am I living a fulfilling life or like, what is my mission? You're like, yes. Dude, I'm thirsty. <laughs> like, yes. I need that. So, uh, and then look at like Aleister Crowley who came from money really had never really had to work for anything. Um, so what could he do? Well, he's like, well, I'm going to go be a mountaineer. I'm going to go spend my time doing that. And then I'm going to go learn all these esoteric, um, you know, concepts i'm gonna go join the golden dawn because that's what you can do when you're like a, a dilettante so you know and you don't have to work you can just occupy your time with you know how does the world work what's really out there what's yeah you know yeah, so, I, yeah. and and I, and I i kind of experienced that in a way um i think i think it's what steered me towards being on this on the spectrum towards being more uh socialist than before was and I and I say that half joking because I'm not a socialist, but um, when I I remember, you know, I've been I don't say poor my whole life, but I never had money, and I just assume I was going to be poor my entire life because that's just the world you live in when you grow up like that, right? And sure. um, I remember because I've been working since I was 13, and never had a pot to piss in right and then I, I joined the military still broke but at least to give you a place to stay mm -hmm. and then i get out of the military and i think man i gotta get i gotta get to college i use that gi bill I, I gotta get to college because my uncle he he's an engineer and i thought he's the only guy i know with money and like he's living a life and i thought I, that's what i want and um i started going to college and i got a job as a janitor making 14 bucks an hour this is in 2003 and I was making 14 bucks an hour and I, it was so much money to me. And I thought like, it was incredible. Like it changed my life. And I, and all I could think of was like, cause I was going to college at the time and I took some social issues classes and, and we talked about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and I, and I, I understood it. And I thought, dude, like this makes me want to act right. Because I, I'd, I'd been in trouble as a kid, like crazy and, um, that was one of the reasons I got out of the military because I was like, dude, fuck this. I don't want to live under someone else's rule and tell me what I can and can't do. And like, I want to smoke weed. I want to do all these things again. Like I used to, mm -hmm. and I got that job and it straightened me out. And I thought, mm -hmm. oh my God, like, this is what it's about. This class warfare is these people who already have it all. These Aleister Crowley types, they want to keep your consciousness suppressed and down in the fight or flight mode all the time. And, yeah. and that, I don't know. It, it was just it was eye opening to sort of, you know, fourteen bucks an hour isn't much, but back in two thousand three, that was a lot of money. Yeah, I, yeah, I was making right. more money than my parents made, uh, and yeah. I was like twenty three. I was like, this is crazy, man. Got you that know. janitor money now. Uh, <laughs> and, and fun fact, that was the third time in my life I was a janitor because I've been a janitor <laughs> many times. Yeah, I've been there. That's basically what my job was uh, on the ship. So. Oh, funny. <laughs> yeah, and, and and life's so weird. And and to sort of bring it back to John D and the occult, I studying conspiracy. I'm I'm really into synchro mysticism now, mm -hmm. um, because of a variety of reasons that just sort of fell into my lap. And and one of the things that was really weird to me was that when I was. Uh, 18 i got this tattoo on my arm uh, i got a i got a 007 tattoo oh dope. <laughs> and i i'd never even seen a james bond movie like i knew who he was like i i'm familiar with it you know right, but right. the reason i got it is because my buddy he um he got he 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 got it tattooed on his arm and he tried to join the military with me but he had too many um offenses in his uh, record and they wouldn't let him in 
and after I got in, I I got the tattoo because like that was my that was my boy, man. Like I missed him, you know, and like it was just kind of like a fun thing to do. And and he he's dead now. He ended up overdosing a few years ago, and you know that would have changed his life if he could have got in. But he just he he's also a troublemaker as a kid, and and I think like how bizarre that I got this tattoo and now I'm and I, and I like James Bond. Don't get me wrong, I've seen many James Bond movies since then, but it's bizarre that I got into all this occult stuff and sort of one of the godfathers of the occult went by 007 and i had no idea well, yeah. of course i didn't know that when i was 18 i didn't even know john d was um and, and i just think that sometimes when i when i study these ideas like alistair crowley's talk about a true will and things i like i don't want to follow alistair crowley like he's the bad guy you know but i think man some of these concepts they stick out and i think man there's something to it and it, and it ties into quantum physics and yeah and yeah reverse quantum. causality maybe you're you know the reason you got that tattoo was because you knew in the future you would be interested in these things oh, interesting like, yeah it affected the past rather than you know moving in one direction yeah so, which would tie into the ai thing right because yeah, like, yeah, yeah. ai is just us from the future and, and that's mm -hmm. a really bizarre idea Right. Or the AI is reaching into the quantum realm, you know, through quantum computing. So it's sort of the information rather being in um, uh, ones and zeros. It's in this like superposition of both one and zero until the answer is is selected, you know, for presentation. That's kind of the concept of quantum computing. And some of the the you know, most advanced AI models are run off of quantum computing. So it's like, are these uh models like ai pulling information from the quantum realm what is the quantum realm is it another dimension is it you know how does that all so maybe it's it's literally like pulling it's it's channeling something from another realm <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah it's so it's so strange to me um yeah. okay yeah. sorry I, I don't want to get you off track there no soon. no you're, you're you're totally fine. So we're introducing John. <laughs> yeah, yeah. John All right. So, uh, but stage one. No, no. We 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 talked about some a lot of stuff. So let me. Uh, okay, here I'll hop into this. So, these occult philosophy. These occult philosophy is a complex web of Renaissance thought, Hermeticism, Christian Kabbalah, alchemy, and the emerging scientific method. Um, his motivation was looking for a grand unified theory, a theory that could explain all of reality. Um, for him, it, well, mathematics was the key to this universal wisdom. Hermetic okay, which, which ties us back to, you know, and, and you probably know this, I'm sure, but like for listeners, it ties us back all the way back to Pythagoras in, mm -hmm. you know, 500 BC. And this is, you know, the uh, Neoplatonism is one of the philosophies that fell out from that that a lot of occultists follow. And uh, again, just a recurring theme of, mm -hmm. of sacred geometry, mathematics universal yeah. languages and things go ahead sorry 100 um and so essentially hermetic magic was concerned with repairing the fallen nature of the individual alchemist essentially it's turning the lead into gold of like you know your your spirit or whatever um and and the fallen nature of all mankind by catalyzing the second coming of christ so that why it was sort of like how alchemy fits into ushering in the eschaton is saying that right now like the earth is is lead and we need to turn it into gold by triggering the second coming of christ is, is that a gnostic idea i think it, it makes it sound like well this this realm is is damaged and it's such a mess sure uh, that we need to uh sort of wipe the slate clean and start over that sounds like gnosticism to me yeah. i don't know that d necessarily like would have considered himself a gnostic but it, it says you know Christian Kabbalah and Hermeticism are, you know, two of his uh, kind of philosophies. So it could be, it, yeah, maybe Christian Kabbalah could be considered mm. with Gnosticism kind of, you know, traverse from uh, Kether to Malkuth or opposite. Mm. Um, yeah, that's, and that's, yeah. again, with the weird parallels with Christianity, uh, do, do you have an echo on your side, or is that just me hearing that? Um, I don't hear an echo. Okay, uh, all right, we'll roll with it, and hopefully, it's not showing up on the recording. Yeah, yeah. Um, the in Christianity, of course, there's the the fall of man, and man is born with sin, and this is one of those parallels where I think are the occultists and the Christians noticing the same ideas, but they have two paths for how to 
remedy this dude, thing. That, that's 100 percent it so crowley for example really was just sort of taking the other side of the coin you know like crowley's philosophy and and him being a satanist which he, he is a satanist he's a self-described satanist not like a levian satanist but um is really it it does not work outside of the paradigm of like god and lucifer and the devil and jesus you know what i mean so he was crowley was trying to usher the eschaton as well it wasn't the set necessarily the second coming of christ or like the end of the world but it was the uh, it was the ushering in of this new aeon the the aeon of horus you know so the three and this is all stuff that he channeled through doing enochian magic john d's system he took all the tablets and stuff which i'll get into in a minute but um and essentially what he was you know downloaded i guess is that there was these three periods there was um like hadith uh, no, I'm, I'll find in my notes, but essentially a matriarchal period of time, a patriarchal period of time, and then a childlike aeon. So matriarchal was essentially pre-civilization. This is like the mother earth, you know, um, kind of the just the laws of nature that sort of exist. Patriarchal aeon starts with uh society essentially and and think about all the patriarchal civilizations you know rules order you know structure we do it this way this is mm -hmm. you know this is how and then the third like being um this this childlike uh aeon of horus which is about um it's dual gendered i have it written down real quick all right yeah so nuit hadith and horus those are the three periods and then um the childlike phase is all about dual gendered characterized by liberation of the species from its ancient oppressive structures by granting promethean magical powers to the masses that's what interesting yeah so that was what crowley sort of b believed he was helping usher in I, i'm actually reading a in kenneth grant's book he's talking about uh freighter akkad is some other guy tied in crowley and um freighter akkad talked about this new age's aeon of of matt um oh. it's supposed to be i don't know some kind of mini fourth age or something like that but but yes uh john d is instrumental in 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 all of those ages but the idea is the idea that we could take away from that, uh, at least for my research, what I think of is a lot of these elites think they can time these these cycles or something like they, they're, you know, when you talk about the Great Reset, they base a lot of ideas on the uh, that Generations book from the 90s where it talks about different cycles of time. And then you've got like the Kali Yuga and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, it just seems like, again, that these high up elites, they kind of know that there's cycles to be jumped upon and they're trying to usher in the new one or take advantage of it or something like that. Sure. I mean, yeah, if you're not hungry, you can worry about what cycle, what, what you go we're in, <laughs> you know what right. I mean? Like when you're not just trying to pay, pay rent, you have the time to worry about these things. And then, Hmm. You know, how do I affect it? I, you're a master and commander in, in all other realms of your life. Why not? you know, for reality themselves or shaping society or shaping um, this stuff. But uh, where I want to hop in is an interesting um, spot. So, okay, let me, let me talk a little bit about the system itself, like what it is kind of briefly without getting okay. too deep in the, about the Enochian system. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially how it worked was John D was like, the scientist and he needed someone with like psychic abilities, you know, to do the scrying. So scrying is essentially, you know, uh, like looking in a crystal ball, they would have these things called scrying stones, which are essentially black, uh, uh, polished obsidian, you know, black mirror, like the show black mirror, you know, like our iPhones, black mirrors. It's kind of interesting how these things, but so Edward Kelly, who was like a total degenerate. I mean, he had one ear cut off because he was like, uh, it was a corporal punishment for being a thief. Um, he was just like a, a shady dude. And 
John D was like the, you know, very like religious um, science guy. But so how it would work was the pro there was a process of sanctification and illumination. They would purify themselves and then they would start, um, you know, doing scrying, gazing into reflective surface for long periods of time. Um, and they would, you know, have these like essentially like trippy kind of like visions or channeled communications with these non-human intelligences that, you know, presented themselves as angels. And what they would tell them to do was make all of what's now called like the temple furniture. So they instructed them on, you know, uh, this like holy table, a wax seal and all this various magical paraphernalia. And so then what you start doing is called scrying the aethers. So scrying is the like, you know, uh, looking in the black mirror. And there are 49 aethers. Each aether pertains to a part of the world. Together, reveal the locations of the 12 scattered tribes of Israel. It, it was fundamentally about the restoration of consciousness and ascending the tree of life back up towards Godhead. For, and they, are they talking yeah. about for all of humanity or like i don't really understand um, what what do you what do you think they what do you think they mean by that so they're scrying the aethers mm -hmm. um and and somehow that links us to the idea that they're going to fix yeah I, I think it, i think it's it's sort of like so hermeticism is about you know um taking the individual from lead to gold through the process of illumination right and i think how this pertains to that is it's about taking um all of humanity from like the, this fallen state of man and bringing it up restoring the consciousness ascending it back up the tree towards godhead <laughs> one thing that's a distinction about enochian magic versus other systems like chaos magic is uh enochian magic would be considered a high magic and chaos would be low magic so enochian is not the type of magic one would use to manifest a better job or more money or like you know uh things in the material world it's not really for that it's kind of like this theurgic you know um trying to elevate one's self through the destruction of ego and just you know learning the truths of so so in this case it's like mm. he's trying to do this for humanity like self, uh, not self-serving, but like self-sacrificing wise, because his life like falls apart um, and, and kind of ends up in ruin. He's broke. He's, you know, no respect. And even today, now he kind of gets um, attention for his occult stuff. But none of this, be, even though he did tremendous work in like navigation, um, lenses, like the, the creation of like telescopic lenses and stuff like that, um, he doesn't even fully get a lot of credit for that because of the association with the occult stuff. So um, that's a little distinction about uh, the, the systems. And um, okay. So here's like an example of one of the visions. So it would be in a vision of like the archangel Michael appearing in the clouds, giving spiritual guidance and prophecy prophecies of the end times. Uh, there are visions of revelation, like the book of revelation. So white horses of the apocalypse messages about the antichrist, the whore of Babylon. Um, and then D and Kelly start experiencing a bunch of poltergeist activity. So like items, teleporting, apports, um, shadowy figures, apparitions, um, arms appearing out of the air. Uh, and then, so just like crazy stuff starts happening where they're like, you know, that wall between dimensions is sort of thinning. Is that, is that, that's interesting. So uh, I, I don't want to pump the brakes for one second. No, here, it's fine. Dude, anytime. Just we were talking down. about, um, sorry, I'm having an audio issue over here. Um, we were talking about the, you said they could, they saw visions of the pale horse. And what was that? Well, you said something before that. Uh, yeah. Uh, I said, uh, uh, Whore of Babylon. Uh, let's see. Oh, um, my the Archangel Michael. That's it, Archangel guys. Michael. Yeah, yeah, because that's in uh, Dinah Pasalka's. I was just thinking that I just read that encounters book, and that was a great interview, by the way. Oh, but thanks. Yeah, there was so much because I, I read obviously, I read this book a while ago, but I was going over it again, you know, to, to prep for this, and I had just read encounters. 
and was like, dude, this is, it's crazy how much like all of this UFO stuff, you know, really it's, it's no mystery why it's coming to the surface in our time now, you know, it's, it feels like. Do you remember? At, so when I interviewed her in 2020, her next project was supposed to be a book about John. Yeah, yeah right. And right. it didn't happen. And I mean, uh, for whatever reason, I don't know why, but yeah, yeah. Huh. Um, okay. Go ahead. Sorry, man. I just uh, no, no. You're, you jump in anytime. It, it's fine. I, I like I, I like the way this is going. Um, so yeah, at some point, the angels tell D and Kelly to swap wives, which also happens with Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard. Um, and they were told that this was meant to unify Dee and Kelly as one being, which would complete the first phase of the apocalypse. Uh, but Dee can't seal the deal. And so things get awkward between him and Kelly. And then that kind of, you know, fall, falls apart. Um, long, you know, fast forwarding a little bit, Dee falls, has fallen out of favor with the queen and was so poor by this time that he, uh, needed charity from Kelly and his wife. Um, Kelly, uh, had no issues, though, claiming that he was a great alchemist who could turn lead into gold. So Kelly had a great career after that. He would just go to the next monarch and be like, yeah, I'm like a super famous alchemist. Like, I'll turn your lead into gold. All I need is a bigger lab, you know, six months of salary and da, 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 da. And then, and then obviously he wouldn't be able to do it and be like, ah, well, shucks, we'll get him, you know, and then he'd go to the next monarch. And so he had a pretty decent career after this. But this is where it starts getting interesting. So the invisible college D would become the headmaster of a new invisible college, a secret network of minds connected by shared ideals who may never meet each other, but resonate in perfect harmony across the globe. So talking about uh, Jacques Vallée and some of these other, you know, invisible college members, you know, they're kind of doing the same thing. Literally, you know? literally the same term. Yeah, yeah, it's literally the same term. And and uh, it's interesting that Jacques Vallée is a Rosicrucian, as I, what I learned from that Encounters book. Because and, yeah. and I listened to an interview with um, J. Allen Hynek's son, because J. Allen Hynek in Encounters, I learned that J. Allen Hynek was, you know, I don't know, buddies with Jacques Vallée, and they were both Rosicrucians. And mm -hmm. his son, because several months ago his son was on some show on youtube and i took notes and i planned on doing a show about it and i it just fell by the wayside but he was talking a lot about this occult stuff and he was a rosicrucian also yeah it's super interesting so what are these guys witnessing that that steers them in this direction to these i mean relatively obscure belief systems and and so such. so where, where it kind of like leads over into like rosicrucian is is after king james takes over so because of like this like very protestant clap down on all things supernatural um it had to go underground and so uh they outlaw witchcraft and stuff and so d is a symbol of the occult and parodied in in pop culture through works of like dr faustus the alchemist and the ideas within the rosicrucian manifesto so these ideas uh ferment and mutate for a couple of decades and emerge as the rosicrucian manifesto the rosicrucians oh. act as countermeasures to the jesuits who are like the catholic military client sort of esoteric order uh, the rosicrucians were like the the protestant version of that and martin luther was likely a rosicrucian and you can see this in the uh, the seal of his like his official seal there's like the rose uh the the rose and then there was a couple other things he talks about in the book, but it's like there's indication that Martin Luther could have been a Rosicrucian. And so, it, you know, what did he do? He has the Magna Carta um, and that sort of ushers in this new age of like religious, not not like religious tolerance, but more. So um, it, it's these new ideas work their way into modern thought and inspires the values of institutions like Freemasonry through the works of Francis Bacon, Shakespeare, the Golden Dawn, um, and Aleister Crowley. So these new hermetic religion of unity, love, and intellectual tolerance flourish in Bohemia, eventually leading to the French and American revolutions, um, the Royal Society, the scientific method, modern medicine, 
humanism and so much of the Western society, including American empire. These are all because of D's ideology and how mm. that sort of it goes underground. It starts to so this idea that like uh, you know what what is Freemasonry? It's like that you know we're all it's a lot of the tenets of what American Constitution and stuff. All of our founding fathers were Freemasons, and so they had this sort of like enlightened religious tolerance. All men are created equal. Um, a lot of these things that were very novel for the world at the time that was like, what do you mean? You're like, there, no, no, no. There's aristocrats. And then there's peasants. Like there's no all men created equal crap. Yeah. Like, what's, well, this is all the, the philosophy that kind of underground, you know, becomes what the Freemasons and the, the Hermeticists and stuff like that. And that goes all the way into the United States through, through the American and French revolution. Right. And, and the, let's take a second to pause yeah, on yeah. that because yeah, the, it's curious to me because a lot of folks want to say that America was based upon Christian values and I'm no historian, but the version that I understand was that a lot of Rosicrucians from uh, Europe. And, and I, I think this lends itself to what you were trying to say there. Like John D basically sparked this movement that was, uh, you know, Martin Luther was a part of, and, and Martin Luther started the Protestant church, which basically questioned the authority of the, the Catholic church. And back then the Catholic church was, they worked hand in hand with the government or the Royals, mm -hmm. the monarchy. Mm -hmm. And it was a very oppressive society from what I understand. I, I don't know how oppressive I've read and I don't know what years, but I've read it was as oppressive as, well, the, the church and state tell you this is who you're going to marry, this is your job, and this is your life that you're going to live, which is obviously terrible. And Protestantism and, uh, I guess, Rosicrucianism, if that's baked into it, sort of opened the door to say, you know what, this isn't the only authority. And then the Rosicrucian movement came to America as part of that to get away from that church and state authority yeah. And set up our own colony and say, look, we don't need this this uh, church and state monarchy telling us how to live. We're going to do our own thing and we're going to be. And that's why in the First Amendment, it's a, a freedom from religion, freedom from religion. Right. Exactly. The, the other all that is definitely true. The other thing that Protestantism did that was separate from Catholic Church said that you could have a direct relationship with God. You don't need the church institution to intermediate because Catholic church, you know, during this period, this is when they were like, I forget what the term is, but where you could buy those things that would absolve you from your sin. So it was like a whole, it was just a corrupt institution at that time. You know, I mean, you could argue still today, but especially at that time, that's why even the Catholic church had been reformed, you know, in, in since times think about all the missionaries, like in, uh, um, the Western states, uh, you know, all the missions in California, Southern California, there's mm -hmm. all these different missions. Those were Spanish Catholic missionaries that would come over and like, you know, absolutely oppress and try to convert all of the savages to mm -hmm. Catholicism. And not that Protestantism was much better, but this is what Martin Luther was sort of like, I don't know that this is, you know, there, there might be another option to do this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, and you you mentioned Francis Bacon, and I've I'm no expert on Francis Bacon either. I've I actually follow. Uh, there's a listener of mine who started a podcast called The Hidden Life Is Best, and mm, it's cool. a very good, interesting look at Francis Bacon and his influence on the occult and the British Empire and Gnosticism. Uh, it's called The Hidden Life Is Best. Um, I think he still updates it. He had, he's got a bunch of shows on there. Regardless, um, it's it's a really interesting look at the connections of francis bacon with shakespeare and i i've heard that francis bacon was actually the author of the king james version bible i, oh, I don't know if you ever heard that and, yeah, and maybe and i've never i'm not an expert so i don't know if that's true or common knowledge i, I don't know I've, i haven't thought about it until just now but i it's always stuck in me i thought because francis bacon has all these occult connections and yeah. I had a guest on many years ago, uh, Michael Wan, who he's done a ton of shows oh, yeah. since then. No, right. Yeah, remember? Yeah. The Susqu yeah. Yeah, yeah, he did the Susquehanna Alchemy stuff. Yeah, right. Um, 
and he deep dived into it. Uh, it's also fascinating. Um, totally, totally. And I, yeah, I, in like the covers of those books, or at least like on Shakespeare posters and stuff, like if you circle this letter and this letter and draw the line, and it has all these like sacred geometry and like you know, um, uh, forgetting the term, but you the the, the spiral that is in all things yeah, and stuff the like Fibonacci that. sequence yeah yeah yeah, yeah exactly exactly yeah. um so yeah there's there's they were hiding a lot of this sort of like occult math science stuff in literature and sort of like new age philosophy and culture and doesn't it seem like isn't it interesting that it seems like all these occult things that were hidden for so long seem to be coming to the forefront, seem to be more, I don't know, mainstream is the right word. And at the same time, there almost is this weird push coming from the other side of the equation of, and and I don't know how to say, how to verbalize this besides just, this is how I feel watching current events and stuff. And, and that subjects me to, you know, mainstream media, which is obviously, I don't know how accurate a lot of that is, but there seems to be this, other side of the equation coming back and trying to push a, a sort of fascist christian nationalist like we're going to force you to be a christian thing that wasn't that wasn't here 20 years ago mm-hmm. and it, it almost seems like these two opposing forces are are are, are coming to this battleground and all of yeah. us are kind of like especially if you're a, a free thinker and and you know like like you and i were kind of in the middle like well, geez, I don't know if I want either one of these things, you know? Totally. totally. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know what the reason is, but it does. It's, it's interesting to see just how prophetic um, Alistair Crowley, Crowley's, um, you know, visions and, and sort of like, it, it makes a lot of sense when you see what he was channeling and you're like, well, a lot of that's tracking, dude. It's it, it sort of like, um, you know, it, it maths and that might be an interesting no. time to, to segue into, to Crowley. Cause he's an important figure in this whole thing. So D's system of Enochian magic reaches its full expression and inversion under Crowley in the early 1900s. Crowley channels the text, the book of the law, which announces a new era for humanity. He's got the Nuit, Hadith and Horus. I already kind of talked about that. Um, and he also channels, uh, like through his Enochian channelings, um, channels the vision in the voice, which is another one of his books. Um, it's an angelic, the angelic workings conducted while crossing the Algerian desert with Victor Newberg, who's sort of like his um, assistant, magical assistant. And this was in 1909. Um, so Crowley would scry one aether per day. And the book, also this book, talk like it literally goes through each one of the aethers and what he like describes seeing um so it's a little bit pedantic but it's super trippy and like cool so for example uh he has all these trippy visions on the astral plane and in this new aeon it's one's own will that is to be done not god's so that kind of explains why you're, you know, in today's culture, you have a lot more of like, it's like generation me, right? It's all about my expression, my own will, what I want, follow my passions, these things. Not that that's bad, but it, it is before, if you rewind the clock a hundred years ago, it was about like, like organized religion was a lot more important. A lot of these like more institutions doing what your parents want for you, you know, and that's the shucking off of that. And and, and, and that's the big generational difference. I feel when I talk to boomers, you know, my parents are are boomers. I think they're probably the tail end of boomers, but Mm -hmm. when, when you talk to boomers, they, um, and this isn't some kind of indictment on them, but I just think that they have a more, sort of blind trust into the the system from their retirement to the church to politics like they they sort of have this weird like trust in all these things and Mm -hmm. you know growing up as a i'm on a cusp of gen x and millennial um you know growing up i i think like how could you trust any of these things right you know 
I mean, I think it goes beyond even just like trusting of institutions, which it absolutely is. And that was sort of what I mentioned earlier about like, um, you know, the shucking off of these oppressive structures that have been imposed from this patriarchal um, aeon. Um, but uh, on top of that, I like just lost my... Um, what was the last thing you said? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I was just saying how it, it seemed like when, when I... My when I talk to boomers, they uh they sort of have this this trust in a system from from trusting big farm. I mean, and that's one of the big frustrations I have is their trust for big pharma. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, like, no, you can't just get unhealthier and keep taking more medicine. Right, right. right. Like this path leads you to being in a in a wheelchair and sick and unhealthy and unable to move. And and uh -huh. they just and they and they do it. And it's frustrating. Um for me to watch, you know, these are people I love, like to watch them just sort of the, you know, and, and I, and I go, I go to a regular doctor. In fact, I went to a regular doctor for a physical the other day and the way he talks to me, I'm like, I'm like, bro, like, I, I don't, I don't believe half the things you're telling right. me. And, right. and, you know, my, medicine has its place. I'm not saying doctors for are sure. wrong or I know sure. more, but I mean, when, you know, some of their, uh, some of the, the practices that they, they want me to follow. I'm just like, dude, yeah, like, that's I think not it's like, it's I'm asking those questions and, um, you know, kind of at, I think in, at its full expression or an even greater expression of it that we see with the younger and young, like millennials and Gen Z is this sort of postmodern approach to everything. So postmodernism is essentially that like, the way that you learn something like it's just a narrative so that there are different narratives. So this idea that like uh, the U S is the, a bunch of liberators and we just go and we help everyone in the world. Well, a postmodernist thought would be like, hold on, like let's unpack that, you know? And then you start looking into like, well, what, what is the actions of America actually over time? And you see that it's a different narrative. So that's sort of a postmodernist approach. Just same thing with, with medicine and be like, Okay, but hold on, let's unpack that, do the take this pill, it make you feel better. Um, but at its fullest expression, it's like nothing anything is meaningless. There is no objective reality, everything is just subjective experience and you know, some narrative. And so mm -hmm. it sort of like becomes this amorphous thing, and that's very like aeon of horus in that like it, anything is possible, nothing is uh definitive. Um, so yeah, let me go through a little bit more, some Crowley stuff. So this is interesting, the beast 666. So we, you talk a lot about on your show about, um, inversions and sort of the unification of opposites. We see that in a lot of like symbolism, you know, the Masonic checkerboard, stuff like this. Um, so this is explains what that's or where that kind of comes from. So the underlying motivation of Crowley's vision in the voice book is to cross the abyss. Um, the abyss it, it, and duality cannot exist in the abyss because duality is a quality of manifestation and the supernals, which are sort of like the entities of the abyss, they are unmanifest. So the aethers are filled with non-dual contradicting statements. So you're, he's having these trippy visions and they're like all this like really weird sort of contradictory stuff. And what the purpose of this is, let me go a little bit further in my notes. So the implication is that a symbol is only true in so much as it contains its own opposite. So good is, so good is bad and vice versa. So everything needs to have its opposite. A symbol is only useful as in so much that it contains its opposite. And that's the concept of D's monad, which is this unifying principle uh, from which all things manifest. Th during this period, this is where Crowley's living in Sicily in uh, uh, Cefalu. And he has like his little abbey over there. And it's where he's his most unhinged. This is him trying to immerse himself in addiction, horror, degradation, disease, and the mysteries of filth, as he put it, in order to sort of like see the others, see that there is, you know, holiness in, in uh, filth and sort of the opposite, you know, because everything that is true contains in itself the opposite. Um, so he writes a bunch of really messed up stuff like 
most of it's probably coded language, but he was saying like it, during this period, he would write stuff like uh, he wants to dig up and have sex with the wi his wife's deceased mother. Um, during this time, a couple of his kids die from neglect and he gets kicked out of Mussolini. And uh, this is one of the periods where he is like labeled like the most evil man mm -hmm. uh, in the world, the, the beast 666. And he views himself like, okay, that is me. I'm the beast 666, the antichrist. And I'm here to proclaim a new aeon for humanity. Um, so Karanzan 333, this is, you've, you've used that term Karanzan. Uh -huh. So while scrying the 10th Aether, this Aether in particular, this is when he's in Algeria with Victor Newberg. They're doing these um, scrying things each day. This Aether is so accursed that the magicians are to use a special circle and triangle like in Goetic Magic. Karanzan manifests and speaks through Crowley during this time, and he keeps trying to tempt Newberg by taking various forms, to, like as a beautiful woman, a wise holy man. Um, he starts mocking Newberg, and the whole ordeal ends up driving Newberg like completely insane, and he never can, never recovered from that whole um, ordeal. But through this, um, Crowley. Uh, enters this like period pyramid of light in his like vision where he meets his holy guardian guardian angel named Iwas and Iwas delivers him a set of instructions for attaining knowledge and conversation uh, to love wait not knowledge and conversation with like your HGA your holy guardian angel and this new method is to replace the earlier instructions in the book of Abramelin which was like how they did that before. Um, let's see. So during this vision, it, he's so terrified by it. This was crazy, dude. And to your viewers, you know, just be, be warned. So um, the worst part of this vision is Lilith, who is Babylon, um, appears as a black monkey whose body is rotten and, rotten and cancerous. She seeks to embrace Crowley, who is so horror struck that he cries out to be killed to end the vision. In this vision, Lilith masturbates with a crucifix. The stench of human flesh and children's bowels is thrust into Crow Crowley's mouth. Um, and it coincides with uh, this was like around like the 1930s, like 1933. And David Grush talks about the first uh, UFO, like publicly one that we know of was the 1933 UFO crash in uh, Italy that Mussolini recovered. Mm -hmm. So it was, it's just interesting, like Crowley's going through these aethers, having these like crazy visions, and then it's coinciding with now some of the first UFO uh, stuff that we are um, dealing with interesting I, okay let's let's pause right there because yeah, please, please. there's a ton to unpack on this yeah. uh and, and you're referring to grish was talking about uh, enrico fermi was also at the same time messing around with nuclear energy he was the guy who if you watched oppenheimer the movie they, i think they show it in there where he was um he was part of that but he was mess he was one of the first people that discovered nuclear uh, I think it's fission. I could be getting it wrong. Fission or yeah, fusion. Yeah. I don't remember. I think it's fission. Yeah. And um, and it was in the same area. So a lot of people question if that has something to do with. But that's interesting. I never thought of that. How Crowley was also doing strange dark rituals, um, in Ker Kerfalu or whatever it's called. That. Yeah, yeah. Ch Chefalu, Cephalu, Cephalu. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. Because in in the in the world of Twin Peaks. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna tease you with something that maybe it'll it'll serve you to keep going <laughs> in the Twin Peaks in season two, and this won't be a this isn't really a plot spoiler necessarily, but in season two you start learning about what what they're calling the White Lodge and the Black Lodge, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, Hawk, who's the Native American police guy, he tells Cooper about it. He says because because there's 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 a guy an Air Force Major Briggs. He knows about the White Lodge and making contact with entities and stuff. And he right. mentions it to Cooper. And then you've got Hawk who talks to Cooper and he's like, yeah, my my people, you know, the Native Americans going back to the Nez Pierce tribe that have, what settled that area. He said, we we knew about the White Lodge and the Black Lodge. And there's a Black Lodge that 
if you approach it with an imperfect soul, uh, your soul will be annihilated. And they call it the dweller on the threshold, which is precisely what Crowley called Coron Zone was the yeah, dweller yeah. in the abyss. And yeah, it's the same absolutely. thing because in, in confessions, in Crowley's confessions, he talks about how in the abyss, it's filled with these spirits. I think he calls them dust devils. He says there's these spirits and all they want to do is sort of attach to a body and manifest and be incorporated mm. to a real life being, which um, fits into the plot line of Twin Peaks, as mm -hmm. well as some of the theories Bob Lazar was talking about when he claimed he saw pa paperwork saying that these aliens were looking for humans because they, they saw humans as uh, containers for the soul. Meaning, uh, possibly they're trying to infuse spirits into human bodies. That's and, also uh, the Scientology. That's like uh, the, you know, the Thetans or whatever that were like, oh I mean, yeah, thing, you know, it's a, yeah. that we're from this other planet. These like alien beings that their planet gets destroyed, and so then they, you know, took like an escape pod to Earth and that's that we're actually like the vessels of these ancient thetans aliens that and that's what we're trying to uh go clear so that we can um you know access all of that knowledge and uh information or whatever right it sounds yeah. very similar <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 okay fascinating it's all right covered, this part gets interesting so i'll kind of fast forward through again this is like the check chunk of the book where you can get really lost in the weeds but it kind of comes back around around here so i, I labeled this in my notes uh crowley parsons civil rights nasa rock and roll lil nas x you know <laughs> the each thing so i like it all this trippy shit leads Crowley to start his AA order and his religion, Thelema. He starts liking some of the ideas of the OTO, realizing that all magic is basically sex magic, so why not lean in? He eventually parts from the OTO over disagreements with like the other founder and uh, uh, founds his orthodox Thelema circles. A guy named Wilfred T. Smith starts like a second Thelemic circle in Pasadena, and that becomes Agape Lodge number two. The Agape Lodge attracts a guy named Jack Parsons. And now J John D. and Jack Parsons are like the same guy. It's crazy. So like D., Parsons straddled the worlds of science and the occult. Um, he founds JPL invents solid state fuel, finding inspiration from Greek fire. Um, and like D, he would immerse himself in Enochian magic, working the system with a charlatan who would betray him and defraud him, which was L. Ron Hubbard, just like Kelly, you know, did the same thing. Uh, and then uh, Jack Parsons is also mostly remembered for his contribution to science, not his contribution to the occult. He finds his true calling in Thelema after he attends an, a Gnostic mass at the Agape Lodge. And there's a pretty cool show. It's not that great of a show, but it's a, it's um, it's called Strange Angel. And it's sort of like a dramatized biography of Jack Parsons. And uh, you know, it's not like the best show ever, but it does a good job of sort of like, like every time I'm like reading my notes, I'm, I'm visualizing the show. So it's yeah, pretty it's pretty good. good. They, the, they um, you'll notice, cause I watched both, I think it was two seasons of it. <laughs> they they finish up season two and they never renewed season three. But what happens at the end of season two? He meets L. Ron Hubbard and that's where they cut the show. Uh -huh. And, and uh -huh. I suspect it's because because it was actually a really good show. And I, I suspect yeah. maybe season three was going to expose us too much. That. I would not doubt that you probably got, you know, it's in Hollywood trying to, you know, film a show that then starts going into their great leader. Like, yeah, I, I, that right. makes a lot of sense. Um, so anyway, he starts uh, working through the material. Jack Parsons starts working through the material for both the AA and the OTO. He eventually becomes disillusioned with the OTO, thinking it incapable of or incapable of manifesting the law of the Lima. Um, he starts making good money at JPL, doing contracts for the government. But he's funneling all of his money to Crowley and his heroin addiction. Um, and despite the progress and insights he was experiencing internally, his real world affairs are beginning to disintegrate. So much like D. Mm -hmm. um, his co-workers are beginning to find him eccentric and annoying. 
even his occult superiors didn't love him at this point. Like Crowley rolled, rolled his eyes at his poetry. So <laughs> Parsons and D, you know, retreat from the world of the occult once they were rejected in their, they retreat into the world of the occult once they're rejected by their scientific endeavors. So once he kind of like lost respect as a scientist because he was doing this woo-woo stuff, he was like, fine, I'm just going to do more woo-woo stuff. Um, so Parsons would be swindled by a dubious psychic in L. Ron Hubbard, just as D had by Kelly. Both Parsons and Kelly would be cuckolded by their magical partner. Basically, once Parsons was deprived of his girlfriend, he would manifest the goddess of Babylon herself. So that was sort of like what he was trying to do. Parsons believed that Babylon was the entire point of magic, where Dee and Kelly were terrified of the appearance at the end of their diaries. So that's one distinction is uh, Parsons was like, yeah, this is this is awesome. This is exactly what we're trying to do. Whereas Dee and Kelly were kind of like, oh, I'm scared now. Um, but Parsons believed that the blind, destructive force of Horus would lead to the catastrophic breakdown of civilization. So he was trying to, and that's what he was trying to do, is help philemically usher in this Aeon of Horus, which would result in the breakdown of civilization. And he believed that the whore of Babylon is the aspect of divinity that accepts and the totality of free sexual expression. So now you're talking about like the sexual liberation movement and how that you know, correlates with the, the tenets of the Aeon. So um, he believed that Parsons believed Babylon would be the guiding force that could harness the Aeon of Horus towards destroying the sexual blocks and false ideologies that hold humanity in slavery. He pledged to destroy Christianity and the slave mentality it inculcated. He does this multi-day working in the desert and uh, with Hubbard, and upon returning, finds that a new redheaded tenant has joined the parsonage named Marjorie Cameron. And Marjorie Cameron is now his like Scarlet Woman, but she's also outside of the Parsons story, a very interesting story within like the counterculture. So um, she helped incubate the nascent beat movement. Uh, she appears in Kenneth Anger's inauguration of the Pleasure, Pleasure Dome, um, playing Babylon herself. And uh, so she's on the East Coast for a little bit. And while she's coming uh, back from the East Coast in an airplane, she during this time, L. Ron Hubbard and Jack Parsons were working through the Enochian system. And she sees a UFO, which she believed was proof that Parsons magic was working. So, and then two years after their Parsons and Hubbard's working, a private pilot named Kenneth Arnold reports seeing UFOs near Mount Rainier, Washington. Now, did you know? I'm, I'm gonna. Yeah, yeah. Hop oh, in whenever you, you're. Totally I don't fine. know if you, I don't know if you're going here with it or not, but Marjorie right. Cameron, um, she she uh, saw the cigar shaped UFO um, when she was with Jack Parsons and. Parsons drew a UFO of it was a circle with a triangle inside of it. Interesting. Which I think is similar to the the Harry Potter yeah, Deathly Hollow. Yeah, right? yeah, right, right, right. Um, and and I and I I'm trying to picture the 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 John D. Monad. Is there a circle and a triangle in that, or is it like looks kind of like it, it kind of looks like a like almost like a Mercury sign. So it's essentially like a stick figure man with like uh like a crescent moon okay. shape, you with know a circle so, underneath it right yeah yeah with a circle underneath it a dot it's kind of like a stick figure looking dude um and yeah it, each like curve and everything is supposed to be symbolic of something that encompasses like the universe and reality and whatnot um okay i'll, I'll look for it in the book while, while you continue I, I i just wanted to stop you right there for a second yeah, no, yeah you're uh, you're you're Talk totally fine. So I'll, uh, I'll, while you're looking for that, I'll, I'll go. So, yep. Yep. There you go. Oh, there's, there's, if you're watching the video version, that's the, uh, the monad there. Yeah. So it's like soul, Luna, soul. Yeah. Like Luna, sun, soul, moon. Elementa, and Ichnus. It's on yeah, page one. Fire, fire and Earth, I think, would be the other one. So it's all, um, okay. So now to, uh, da, 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 um, Crowley, Acolyte, Kenneth Grant believed that something pierced the veil, his quote, during the Babylon working in 1947. As of 1949, he projected that as Antichrist, he would conquer the world in 
in the name of B666 and bring Thelema to the entire planet, manifesting Babylon herself within the world in seven years. So here's some of his predictions that get pretty crazy. So many of the tenants in Parsons' book, which was the book of the Antichrist is what it was called, uh, would be fulfilled. So the baby boomers, which were now teenagers at this time, would demand sexual liberation. Uh, also like freedom of consciousness with like acid and, you know, like that whole movement. Um, they rejected Christianity and its sin complex. They reject conscription. They lashed out at prosaic 1950s society. Um, they would work miracles through the medium of high tech. In 1958, um, uh, established the EEC, which was the precursor to the EU, which if the EU would become that in 1993. And Babylon is referred to in Revelation as the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. So that's where a lot of like, you know, the fundamentalists like look, see the, the EU and be like, oh, it's the big satanic organization because it's a one world government. That's where, you know, some of this like stems from. Um, and by the 1960s, much of the counterculture would resemble the less extreme bits of Crowley's Thelemic cult in Shefalu. So this is the feminist movement, uh, interest in witchcraft and magic, Crowley on the cover of the Beatles album, Jimmy Page buying um, Crowley's house. Now you fast forward to today, Babylon is more popular in our current world than Christ. Um, there's more sexual liberation, anti-Christianity. You have Lil Nas X twerking on the devil, Katy Perry appearing as Babylon during the Super Bowl halftime show. Um, you know, and just to recap some of those symbols from the Katy Perry thing. So she's dressed in scarlet and red flames. She's riding on the back of a golden giant like beast, like a lion. Um, she dances on a Masonic checkerboard while asking her viewers if they want to play with magic. Um, she sings about les lesbian sex, like, you know, she kissed a girl and liked it. Uh, mm -hmm. And she's wearing, in one point of that same performance, she's wearing a 49 jersey because it was the 49th Super Bowl series but remember there's 49 aethers <laughs> all um, right right so yeah and and oh. uh uh and yeah 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 and then every man and woman is a star so uh, the last song she sings is firework and she is dressed in a silver star outfit she looks like uh nuit which is like the the night goddess that's where the word night comes from nuit um and she and then what was crowley's AA, the Silver Star, right? Right, which which is a reference to Sirius, yeah. which is you know all over the place and the all UFO stuff. Yeah, exactly. Wow, exactly. wow, that's good, man. That's a good connection with the Katy Perry thing. I haven't thought about that since you know Dude. ten years ago. Yeah, and and Louv is the like Louv talks about that in in there. He's the one that like oh, yeah, in it. the book. And, and, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Now you're you're firing me up to finish this book. Yeah, now. Dude, okay. it's good, man. I'm telling hmm. you. So um, interestingly, this is where kind of he talks about too. So there's the Babylon current and the beast current. So at some point, um, this sort of like diverges into two currents. The Babylon current, this would be uh, the, the OTO, which would later dissolve, but eventually would be reconstituted in the late 60s by a guy named Grady McMurdy. Grady McMurdy was uh, the, the grandfather of like birth of Wicca, neo-paganism, the goddess movement, um, then Gardnerian uh, witchcraft. Then, so that's like the, the, the female current side of this, the Babylon current, right? Then there's the beast current. The beast current includes the church of Satan. This is like might, might makes right. Um, Scientology, the process church. Um, secular humanism in general. And together, these movements collectively make up the satanic resistance to Christian eschatology. Okay, let, let me let me yeah, let yeah. Me pause there for a that. There's a lot there. <laughs> okay, so, so if I understand it, there's two sort of opposing currents that is, is it was it Crowley it's, that you said? Yeah, so well, just it's not exactly opposing, but they're there. It was like, yeah, so imagine like whatever par Crowley, parallel currents, kind of. Yeah, they're parallel currents. It was okay. like it was one thing, you know, with Crowley and, and Parsons, and then like 
you know, within the 60s or however, I don't know exactly what forces the split, but yeah, it breaks into two parallel currents. And you said the one was was the beast current, which is like your satanic Church of Satan kind yep. of darker stuff. And then what was the other one again? Um, the Babylon current. So I would I would classify it as like one is more of like a fem- female, like feminine um, energy, and the other is more masculine energy. So the Babylon current, this would be the the feminine side of things. This is like uh, the birth of Wicca, the goddess movement. You know, think of like a lot of like Beyonce type of stuff, yeah. this, this neo-paganism. Um, and then the beast current, that would be like the masculine side of things. So Church of Satan is like, you know, Mike makes right, um, dar- social Darwinianism. More of, that, more of that sort of law and order. Uh, yeah. Law and order is the wrong term to use with social Darwinian, but like uh, more of like enforcement kind of, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. and, and it includes all the way up to like secular humanism. That is is what he's attributing it to. But like secular humanism is sort of what we're kind of talking about with like Rosicrucianism, like all men are created equal under the law. That's that in this, according to Jason Louv, is part of this beast current as well. Um, oh, interesting. I, I wonder. I wonder why. Oh, yeah, I guess so. Huh. And, and then both of them collectively, fits. both of it, yeah, it's it's probably worth like exploring a little bit more. Like I don't I don't know that I'm maybe giving it justice, but um, he's saying that together, the Beast and Babylon current, those two things are like one side of the coin. The other side of that coin is is like Christian eschatology, and there, so those are the two things that are in opposition. There's like this the the Christian eschatology, the Christian worldview of like the way things are supposed to, to go. And then the opposition to that, the opposition being witchcraft and neo-paganism uh, as well as Satanism and over-reliance on science and stuff like this. This wow, is all okay. sort of like, this is, I think to answer your question earlier about like, why are the Christians pushing back to that? I think it's because all of those things are on one side of the coin that's opposing the Christian eschatology. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it's it, this. This all makes sense because that it does seem like what's going on is you've got these sort of two extremes coming coming to fruition. Yeah, and the Christian angle, uh, I say Christian. I don't think it's every Christian belief, but there is a Christian angle of trying to accelerate the second coming of Christ uh, and creating the end times, and, yeah. and maybe that's they're feeling more fervent about that now because all these. Um, you know, these two currents of the beast and Babylon current are kind of b- gaining traction, you know, and- for sure. For sure. I mean, that's like the, you know, you see why a lot of Christians support or like very fundamentalist Christians support the state of Israel is because they, it, it feeds into their narrative about like, you know, okay, they got to build the temple. They got to destroy the temple one more time. And then they got to rebuild it. And then they got to do this. And then, you know, it's all part of their like checklist, you know, to that is supposed to happen before the second coming of Christ. Okay. Yeah. You and, know? They're, and they're seeing all these other things happen and they're just like, well, now we have to do it now because Harry yeah. Potter's all over the place. And, yeah. 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 Exactly. Girl, women are buying crystals. I mean, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> You're right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, interesting. And 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 to sort of sum that up, you're you're yeah. John D's the guy who uh I wouldn't say he invented the invented the idea of the eschatology, but he was one of the early uh, he, he was getting kind of get there. I mean, so I mean people knew about Revelation, obviously. It has been written for you know hundreds of years, but <laughs> The angels were essentially telling him when he was having these conversations, they're like, hey, this is what you need to do like this. Hey, God's really going to love this. You know, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you should hurry up and, and help, you know, aid things along because, okay. you know, and, and, then, your help. <laughs> and then and then from there, there is this direct line into occult thinking, Alistair yeah. Crowley, ritual magic, Jack Parsons the yeah. 60s and all these things that have happened since mm-hmm. that lead us to today in exactly. fascinating okay all right and crowley like sort of this. is the inversion of of this again same coin right mm-hmm. but he's coming it from it from like i'm just a good christian trying to do what god's telling me to and crowley's looking at it like um you know i'm going to invert this 
and be like, no, like we're, this is, this is, uh, the antichrist that, you know, we're trying to do this to, to crush Christianity and to eliminate the, the constructs and these patriarchal oppressive structures that have been imposed on us by institutions like organized religion. Man, this, this, this is fascinating, dude. You, you did a great job knocking the, uh, knocking out the details and highlights of this book man um, <laughs> and, and like you said at the beginning man like the, like I, there's so much in this dang book like we you, you pulled out a lot of the main sort of takeaways that uh, are important to a lot of the conversations we have on this show um um and, and we got to go here we're wrapping up yeah, is, yeah. is there any other points from the book that you wanted to bring about or did we kind of we kind of <laughs> hit the start to finish the the main sort of takeaways or are there any big juicy ones that we missed that you want to try to get through real quick. Gonna and while you're looking for that, I'm gonna I'm gonna pr- I'm gonna get my uh, I got my my five questions I ask everybody now. Yeah, five, yeah, yeah, cool. Five cool. rapid fires we're gonna do when, when you're ready. Super down. No, it's pretty much it. But this is yeah. maybe a last last little note. So his final kind of chapters in this book is is the inner apocalypse and the outer apocalypse. Apocalypse being like the, you know, the revelation, the revealing of something, the unveiling of of something. Um, So the inner apocalypse being that um, the experience destroys the illusion that there is a self that was ever separate from its surroundings. You know, that all is one things. It really is like the, the, the monad. Um, the world is not fallen, never was. Humanity never left the garden at all. That the crown is in the kingdom and nirvana is in samsara. It is only the serpent, the ego, the mind that thinks itself whole. Karanzan, that distracts us from the bedrock of reality. All is mind. So that's sort of the inner apocalypse. And then the outer apocalypse um, is D and Kelly were prophets of the uh, apocalypse, not one that would happen overnight, but it would take centuries. The British empire was a, a catalyzer. How else did we get to the collapse of the natural world, the degradation of humanity and the destruction of all traditions? Even Steve Bannon believed America had now entered its apocalyptic period. Wow. Okay. And, and that's, that's interesting to me because are, are they, are, is, is Jason Lou saying that these are two different views of reality or this is kind of the same experience? It's, one I think can it's go sort of the same. It's just sort of, it's like there's an internal and external, uh, you know, like an as above, so below type. Okay. Like, you know, you know, these, Cause, these, yeah. Cause he said the inner, the inner apocalypse, if, if I heard that correctly, was it was saying that um, Nirvana is samsara, which I happen to be reading about Buddhism right now. So it's saying that if I understand that, like samsara is the idea that we're on this sort of repeating loop always, and you know this goes and this could go into like theosophy and the idea that you have to break from this loop so you can ascend into the you know the real heaven, the real divine, um, sure. which is kind of a Gnostic concept. But he's right. saying that no, everything's everything's great, and this this repeating cycle is heaven. This is yeah. what we're supposed to do. Nothing is separate. There is not hell and heaven, or nirvana and samsara, or you okay. and me. And it's all it is like the, the the inner apocalypse. The internal revelation is that all is one everything's connected all is mind you've heard, probably heard that saying it's all in your mind you just don't know how big your mind is i think that's a lone mile of Dequette quote oh, okay. um but it's all in your head you just don't know how big your head is <laughs> um yeah. You know. Yeah, a lot of stuff is uh, very much in the realm of psychedelics, a lot of those realizations. Yeah, sometimes. right, right. Huh. And then the outer apocalypse, I don't exactly know what how, how these things are distinction related to each other, but sort of this like, you know, we're trying to, that's the inner revelation of like, oh, okay. And then the external revelation is that, uh, you know, you have to bring in the eschaton. I get a little lost on the outer apocalypse, but it's just interesting that like St- okay. even Steve Bannon and Alexander Dugan and some of these like traditionalists, you know, what they're accelerationists. They're like, we're trying to throw freaking gas on the fire to help accelerate, you know, the end. Like we're now 
America just entered its apocalyptic period. So let's hurry this thing along. Trump's the candidate. He's the chaos candidate. We want right. that guy. That's why that's why Bannon wants him in charge is because he's going to flip the chessboard and and you know take tear everything apart. Okay. Okay. I'm with you. It's kind of uh it's kind of the same concept of exoteric versus esoteric. And it's you know, the exoteric is gonna be, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna literally annihilate all these governments and world concepts whereas esoteric would be more of uh trying to find your journey to you know and become enlightened or something like yeah that. yeah if, if external is one world government internal is like all is one you know maybe yeah. that's part of the, the dude, thing you're blowing my mind today dude this, good job man you you I crushed it. it that was that was excellent dude okay oh, yeah. all right now before you go we're yeah. gonna do the i'm doing the five rapid fire questions for yeah. people i'm sure you already know what, what's coming but this is uh i started this at the beginning of 2022 i don't know why but i think it's fun um <laughs> and you don't need to defend these answers you could do a yes or no's uh make them as short-winded as you want i'm not gonna fight you back on any of them so sweet let's go okay first one do you like tom hanks uh as an actor i do but uh, he's i don't know he's a fishier like looking into all like the the pizza gate stuff there's that, it, but. There's that yeah but. <laughs> yeah he's a there's there i don't know there's there's something there's a little bit of smoke there i don't know okay. what it means probably overblown but uh yeah i do kind of like i see things now in tom hanks roles he was in that uh asteroid movie it was a new wes anderson movie um oh, i can't I remember what it's it. called but he has like a, a bit role in there and he's like a creepy grandpa like uncle guy that is hangs out with like these three little girls that look like little witchy girls and that's that's basically his only role and then, so i see stuff like that now that like years ago i wouldn't have even you know bad an eye or like the uh you know pinocchio movie mm -hmm. where he plays Shadow. stuff like just little stuff you're like i don't know man like now you kind of you can't unsee it, sort of uh, deal. He's a little sus. All right, okay. A sus. <laughs> well, what was your red pill moment? Do you have a red pill moment? Um, to be fair, I don't have a singular red pill moment. I've I got mean, multiples. I have a singular but... one, but you know, one that really was sort of crazy for me was a like a nine eleven um, thing. Like when you, I mean, I'm a patriot. I freaking joined the military. I still you know, love my country and you know, respect all of that. But you, you do have, you kind of see when you get all the facts, you're like, there's a lot here, dude. Again, it's another one of those things where it's just like, it's a little fishy and the mainstream narrative doesn't really make sense. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm with you on that. All right. Uh, what's one conspiracy you 100% believe in? the moon or like i i believe that we did go to the moon oh, wait okay. are you i believe that i don't always, I always... I mean, that's the next question the next question is a conspiracy gotcha. you do not believe in okay the the okay. moon is the one that i do not believe in like, okay I think we went to the moon do you do think human beings walked on the moon yes yes I okay do. all right um, let's talk um, about something you do believe in now. something that i do believe i believe um i already said 9 11 so i'll pick a different one i think the 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 pizzagate stuff is weird dude like if you've yeah. ever seen like the the there's some guy i think maybe like happy buddha or something like that mouthy buddha um there's like a whole bit shoot like series that somebody made going over all of like the like the timothy alifontis guy looking at his instagram clicking on people's instagrams who were commenting on those photos and i followed along dude i did this as much as i could so obviously some people deleted their stuff or or now it's private you know since that stuff but you can find a lot of these things that you're like okay and then it you know the the uh um balenciaga stuff like there are just connections between all of these things and they're all related scandals like Epstein, Balenciaga, Pizzagate, you know, uh, uh, Marina Abramovic. There's again, smoke there. I don't know that you mm -hmm. can, what's so hard is you try talking, telling, like showing somebody this, but it requires so much like context that you can't not sound crazy when you do right. it. You know, yeah, it's I, really awesome. I, I'm with you on that one. That's, that's one. Uh, and something very strange like, like i said I'm, i've been in synchro mysticism a lot lately because i've had a lot of really weird synchronicities in my life and uh the, 
this one's kind of one because last night I, I was telling my wife this morning that I had a dream last night that a friend of ours in the dream, a friend of ours, his brother was James Alephantis, who's the comet ping pong guy that you just mentioned. And, and that's bizarre. You said that because it's like, I probably haven't said that name out loud or thought about it in a year or two, you know, that's so strange. Yeah. Wow. That's weird. Anyway. Okay. Um, okay. Finally, probably the most important question. How do you unplug and keep yourself from going black pill? So I, I like am very comfortable being in both worlds. I almost feel like the way that I unplug from like all the occult stuff is by being grounded in like my business and, you know, surfing and just trying to live like a normal life. Like I want to make money. I'm trying to, you know, travel and buy nice things and like, you know, live a fairly normie uh, existence in that world. But then the way that like, I don't just get sucked into that is by, you know, asking these bigger questions, you know, what is the nature of reality? What's really going on? What do intelligence agencies know? What is our government hiding from us? You know, are aliens real? What is that Skinwalker Ranch? Are there satanic, satanic magicians trying to, you know, so it's sort of like both things pull me out of the either um, mm -hmm. to keep me engaged and not like going full black pill or full yeah. normal. <laughs> See, this is this is why I call you my friend. You don't know this, but I call you my friend, even though we've never met in person. Oh, dude, I, uh, I feel the same way. I really do. <laughs> we've, we've talked a few times over the years, and I just know sometimes there's a vibe that people put out, and I and I resonate with, and and um, I feel the same way, dude. That's why yep. I I have a, a my dreaded day job, and I, technically I could quit it right now, mm. um, but there's something to maintaining that normie side of me that there's a pull there. And, and you might've just said it out loud and I've never really thought of it. It's because there's some days when I do this conspiracy research or the show or whatever, and I have a terrible day and I'm like, man, F this, I don't even want to do this anymore. I don't want to associate with this, this culture anymore. Like I'm done with this. And, right. and, and right. I like that escapism. But then after a few days I calm down, I'm like, all right, I still love these guys. Okay, here we go. Yeah, right. Right. Hear it. You know, so, um, yeah, interesting. Okay. All right, man. Well, I've, I've kept you super long, dude. This oh, might be dude. one of the longest interviews I've ever done. Um, <laughs> so, it was many years in the making. <laughs> yeah, no shit. Yeah. I'm, I'm man, I'm a slow moving, slow moving <laughs> boat, dude. Ask anyone who tries to get with me. Um, yeah. So <laughs> thank, thanks again for uh, thank coming you back. So much, Isaac. Um, tell, tell the people the best place they can follow you and the best way they can get your, uh, phenomenal coffee. Yeah, please. So check check me out at windenseacoffee.com or on um, Instagram, just at windenseacoffee, all one word. Um, feel free to shoot me a message there. If, you know, if you're interested in the products and you want to buy something, like please let me know. Actually, I've had a couple of customers fr that from you, Isaac. Honestly, that like um, another guy named Nick who. Anyway, long story short, okay. but so I would love that, which is super cool. But also if you just want to reach out to me and talk about anything, like just shoot me a DM on uh, Instagram is probably the easiest way, or you can find uh, my email on my website at windedseacoffee.com. But yeah, I'd love to connect. So awesome, man. Yeah. And I'll post links in the show notes for everybody where you can, you can uh, follow the, uh, the Instagram and check out your website and your coffee. I strongly endorse your coffee because I strongly uh, enjoy it every month. So appreciate that. Uh, thanks for all you do, man. Thanks for your service. And um, thanks thank for joining us again. Appreciate it. Well, there you go. I hope that opened up your eyes to some of the ideas of the occult and where the world has been sort of transformed by these thought leaders of the occult, whether for good, worse, better, uh, you know, that's subjective, right? It's up to you. Either way, fascinating talk by Jordan. He's a great guy. Go check out his coffee. And I, I, you know, support the guy because he's a good dude, right? But better yet, it's good coffee more than anything. Uh, I every every month I get a subscription order through the guy. Um, let me let me get the. Uh, uh, sorry, I had to go grab my bag. I, all I know is it's the blue bag. It's uh, I get the Punta Roca. It's got the flavor notes of Valencia orange, dark chocolate, and toffee. It's phenomenal, and you can get the Scorpion Bay is also equally phenomenal. Uh, but you can go get his coffee at windedseacoffee.com. I'm going to put links in the show notes 
go uh go follow him on the instagram too he he'll put up some sales sometimes and he, and he's got a ton of adaptogens you know what i'm saying like with the mushrooms and the cbd and all these great things you can have added to the coffee it's all it's all meant to enhance your mental focus reduce inflammation all those things and and another thing i want to a little personal note uh well i was talking with jordan after the recording and and this guy he's OG granola wokester <laughs> like me right and uh you know that term woke is controversial it's subjective it used to mean something different but the point being uh, he's an OG, right? He he has the same sort of outlook on the world as I do where, um, you know, we try to preserve our resources. You know what I mean? Try to be decent in some way. And one example is he, he mails me coffee and I get them in, uh, he'll, he'll send them in like Amazon uh, bubble wrap mailers. And I said, hey man, like, why do you do that? You know, because most companies, they'll send you stuff in a, a, a nice branded packaging and all that. And I'm like, hey, wh- hey, why do you do that? He says, man, I'm just trying to reuse, dude. Like, I get these, I get stuff in the mail anyway from whoever, Amazon, whoever, and what am I supposed to do? Just throw this away and maybe they'll recycle it. Maybe it'll end up where it's supposed to be. Or I could just reuse it. You know what I mean? Like, let's reuse the thing. Why, why just toss it right away? So, and, and I just love that perspective, right? Like, we don't have to go crazy with, with stuff, but like, that's nice. It's nice. Just to be considerate, right? So, he's a good dude. And he supports uh, great veteran causes. You know, like one more wave, these surfing foundations and all that. So anyways, check him out. Follow him on the Instagram. Check out his coffee on windandseatcoffee.com. I'll put the links in the show notes. Till next time, stay woke. Well.